I'm a neurologist that's friendly, very friendly to what I believe should be at the heart of psychiatry, which is misplaced at the moment, in my opinion, as psychiatrists have literally competed to be more like neurologists and other doctors, and with that left the psychosocial human side a bit behind. Uh, last night I was talking to three fellow psychologists and they said, but, but you're a neurologist. Alzheimer's is a real disease. Oh, what does a real disease mean? Um, the, I have had a career that started in brain nuclei, cholinergic basal forebrain, extended to clinical trials for the cholinesterase inhibitors, included starting a group called the International Working Group for the Harmonization of Dem Dementia Drug Guidelines, then saw a light, maybe not the light, and wrote an article for Arthur Kleiman's journal, Culture, Medicine, and Psychiatry, saying why I no longer consult for the pharmaceutical industry. You'll see, I hope, when we get there. But let's talk about the future first. We seem to be addressing a problem. The problem is, do we ab abolish psychiatry? Do we reform psychiatry? That was the title of the debate yesterday. We seem to be making our problem psychiatry. I think it's very important when you begin to try to solve a problem that you frame that problem well. And I would say that for this first 10 minutes, I'm going to say to you that I will do a Dwight Eisenhower. Dwight Eisenhower said that if you're having trouble solving a problem, make it bigger. Look, it, look at it in the broader perspective because maybe the solution to your problem will be the solution to somebody else prob else, else's problem, and that by looking at it in that broader perspective, you'll come to a different perspective. And the first thing I will say to you is global climate change. Um, I, say, I say, uh, that uh, climate change is the greatest threat to the quality of life of people with dementia. That's the, fear, the theory in which I work. It's the greatest threat of, to the quality of life of all of us, but if you look at Fukushima, if you look at Katrina, if you look at Superstorm Sandy, the older folks and the kids are the most vulnerable to that context. So I think our healthcare system is, and mental health system is going to be dramatically affected as years go on by the fact that we are going to have more and more uh, disasters. I will add, and this has been embedded in some of the earlier talks, the second problem, income inequity. This is a matter of social justice. This is a matter of the fact that, as was mentioned already, the United States is no longer a land of opportunity, and that there are countries where the, the middle class remains somewhat viable and is not shrinking, but in general, around the world, even in Scandinavia, even in Japan, countries that pride themselves on a large middle class, we are growing a world in which the very wealthy, many of whom have got there, pardon my language, by raping the planet, by taking advantage of oil and, and, and business opportunities, are creating the, increasing the disparities. So income inequity is the, large, is the second framing. I think uh, that we, in fact, have to do some very uh, difficult things, which is to reconsider things like the role of unbridled capitalism in our societies and the flow of money into healthcare. And, and, and how, I don't want to make this problem too big, right? And, and how pharma really represents uh, in many ways. So whether it's conscious capital or natural capitalism, there, there, are, there are movements afoot uh, to, to, to slowly to, to do that. I think we are focusing to a world that putting those two together where public health becomes more dominant over molecular medicine. We are talking in the dementia field about prevention. And then the question becomes, do you want to prevent Alzheimer's by giving normal people a panoply of various immunological vaccines, or do you want to create intergenerational playgrounds? So prevention gets us into this conversation about where we put our money and our priorities. Aging is changing. We are reinventing aging. We invented adolescence in 1910. We are now inventing adulthood too, a period before elderhood. That's changing. Education is changing. Higher education is getting lower as we speak. <laughs> the challenges to uh, contingent faculty, student debt, for-profit models, MOOCs, you pick it. The power, now we're getting to a slightly more positive part of this framing, in information technology, digital storytelling, transmedia, virtual reality, 
I think we are creating a world in which the very powerful stories we need to create to counter the dominant narrative in our healthcare systems and elsewhere, are, we are we're developing the technologies to do that in a different way. One of my collaborators is IBM's Watson, the supercomputer that does natural language processing. I'm developing a video game where kids and elders go into a virtual forest and save the forest, just to give you some examples. I think the information technology and the social networks are also contributing to a trend in the world of deprofessionalization. Patient, client, not consumer, centered care is coming into the ascendancy. Lots of professions are losing their power because they've been violating their social contracts with the rest of society. And that includes doctors and psychiatrists. I will say uh, one last thing, and I will put arts, music, dance into this equation that I believe is an ascendancy. I am looking for the I Wei Wei of psychiatry. I Wei Wei is the Chinese poet that helped design the birdcage uh, stadium for the Olympics and refused to visit it, and who also made artwork out of a spreadsheet. The spreadsheet of the names of children who were killed in an earthquake, the, where the shoddy construction led to the schools falling before other buildings. So art, I believe, is going to pay an important. So look for your alliances with the artistic community. Some, some of you are talking about meta para paradigm shifts. I think there's a meta paradigm shift going on. It's not just normal science to another science. It's the whole relationship between science, and particularly scientism, the religion that we all believe in, but can't contest as a religion, that the faith that we have in science is unfortunately become too strong. We are not going to be able to cure things like Alzheimer's disease, for example. I want to tell you what I've been doing in the last couple of weeks. The G7, it was the G8 when it started in London, but then Russia got forced out, has been having a series of meetings about dementia around the world. David Cameron showed up in London. Abe, the prime minister, showed up in Tokyo last week where I was. Cameron appointed Dennis Gillings, the world dementia envoy. He was a billionaire by doing clinical trials, the guy who was associated with quintiles. His priorities for the world of dementia were relaxing regulations on pharmaceutical companies, uh, big data, and getting more people enrolled in trials. Alzheimer's is disappearing in that world. Why is Alzheimer's disappearing? And this is the, the, what, I, what I talked about. because. Many people will not tell you, but the new pathological criteria for Alzheimer's disease are no longer definite. Yes, plaques or entangles are involved, but we don't know exactly how. And as Dr. Jackson's work shows and other people's work, you get plaques and tangles for other reasons. And, and we not only, and Alzheimer's disease is more than one condition. So if somebody says we're going to cure Alzheimer's disease, ask them how many cures do we need. And also ask them, despite the billions of dollars being spent on biomarkers, why we haven't been able to discover a di diagnostic test that separates Alzheimer's from aging. Because it's not different. There's an intense overlap between normal aging and Alzheimer's. Dementia, as you may know, in DSM-5 became major neurocognitive disorder. But that attempt to destigmatize, I don't think is going to do it for the reasons that you heard before. If you medicalize something, you don't necessarily destigmatize it. In Asia, Starting in Japan, they changed the word for dementia in the entire country. They took the word chiho, which means disorder of cognition associated with stupidity, and made it ninji sho, which means cognitive syndrome. And then people in other Asian countries copied. Isn't that an interesting way? It was a website. You got to vote on what you wanted to call or rename dementia. And as I said, I think we're moving towards a different focus, and the Japan conference in Tokyo was about prevention and about models of care and dementia-friendly communities. The, afri the, the expression they use in that meeting is care today, cure tomorrow. And I'm saying, wait a minute, if we find a cure, what does that mean? And does that mean we have to stop caring? So my replacement asterism is care today, care tomorrow, cure, question mark. We have to take this on as a cultural issue. To my knowledge, nobody has studied psychoculture or psychoplasticity, but neuroculture has gone crazy. We've got neurotheology, we've got neuropolitics, we've got neuroeconomics, we've got neurohumanities, we've got neuroleadership, as if putting the prefix neuro in front of things 
enhances his incredibility. So we are challenging that, and the, one of our guest speakers uh, is um, Ray Tallis, who wrote a book, Aping Mankind, Darwinitis, Neuromania, and the Misrepresentation of Humanity. So we do, there's a bigger culture movement that we need to be a part of. My presentation was all about what you've been about, which is the power of stories and telling different narratives. What I'm paying attention to at the moment is disasters. How do we manage disasters? What do we learn from disasters about how we should change our behaviors in relationships to some of these bigger issues that I mentioned? And school-based health care. So I'm engaged in uh, the intergenerational school that I think David mentioned or is in the bio that I have in front of you because I think the most important long-term investment that we can make to challenge all of these problems that we've been addressing, not only the problems with mental uh, health and the field of psychiatry, but, is, uh, but the climate change and the other things, is to educate our children better. I can tell you about my favorite project, which is living a legacy. Living a legacy is with photos. Now, before I show my first photo, let me just tell you where my wife and I are living our legacy, and then I will go on to talking about a couple of legacy projects in that school. The connection, of course, to Laura is about community. I think that's where we have to be going around a lot of these particular problems that we have, including educating our children better and also, from the perspective of a geriatric neurologist, providing opportunities for elders to continue to contribute to the community. So this is a twofer. It's a, it's a social invention that addresses two challenges. My wife is a developmental psychologist. She's been focusing on the kids and I've been focusing on the elders. The Intergenerational School in Cleveland, Ohio started 15 years ago. It is one of the highest performing charter schools in the state of Ohio, and we have now replicated, so we have three schools in Tokyo. It serves the need of 200, the, the original school, 240 urban kids who would otherwise be in kindergarten through eighth grade, but we don't put them in graded classrooms. We put them in developmentally appropriated classrooms. And so a kid may stay with uh, a uh, teacher for three years. And they are advanced on the basis of mastery. Are you ready? Have you learned? And if you haven't learned, you just stay where you are until you learn. And it has produced some of the highest test scores in Ohio. Uh, and uh, for that reason, we are celebrated, although our own mission statement celebrates lifelong learning and spirited citizenship. And the spirited citizenship include nursing students and medical students and undergraduates, not just the very young and the very old, but it also includes older people who come to our school, as well as uh, older folks who are in long-term care facilities. So our kids react and relate to older people in very different ways. The older people do not come and sit in little chairs in the classroom. In our newly designed school, which we moved into a couple of years ago, they work with the children in spaces that are designed to allow comfortable, face-to-face, relationship-building, story-creating opportunities. And so the signature program is Reading Mentors, where these older community volunteers will come in and work with kids individually. These kids are kids from challenged environments in the urban core of Cleveland, although our kids are diversified. Our older folks are very diverse, they include former professors of pediatrics and others. They also include some of my patients with dementia. And uh, we have published a study demonstrating that it, it improves the quality of life and lowers stress in a randomized control study comparing a group of elders with dementia, mild to moderate, who stayed at the nursing home, who then uh, moved, uh, who, who, who did a peer group interaction in the nursing home, or who came uh, to the school by bus to interact with kids, sharing stories and the like. And the quality of life, the quantitative and the qualitative research done by Danny George, which became a PhD uh, thesis for Oxford, demonstrated value in both mixed design methods. But it is in the stories that are told that the, the true benefit, the perceived health benefits, the, uh, the sense of purpose that the elder, elders with dementia felt, and uh, the relationship building. So I'm going to now show you the other slides and end up with a couple of projects that involve people with dementia and kids that involve legacy. 
So all photographs are used with permission, and this is Kay Fuller. Kay Fuller was a neighbor of uh, mine until she moved to one of our partners, Judson Smart Living. She lives in Shaker Heights, where I live. Uh, she uh, was one of a number of largely Republicans, they were different back in the 1960s, who, uh, when they heard that a eventually a prosecuted and, and convicted politician wanted to put a highway right through her house and the Nature Center, fought that politician back and became known as the Clark Freeway Fighters or the uh, tennis shoe uh, activists. And so here are our kids um, from the school going to Judson, in this case, to do a project interviewing Kay about why and how and what she did to actually eventually be invited to Washington to testify uh, there about a local issue that involves saving the Nature Center that our children go to today. We published a series of stories and a series of photographs about the Doan Brook and the, the history of how these elders uh, stopped this process uh, back then. And uh, we used that book in the opportunity, uh, in, in, in opportunity to share these stories about what these elders contributed. Both Mrs. Fuller and Mrs. Barber, shown here, have subsequently died. They both had dementia. Not all the people they, the kids interviewed had dementia. And um, so their legacy lives on in the memories of those kids and in the uh, stories that are in that book. I will say to you that the power of intergenerational learning can be expressed in a number of different ways, but one of which I think is that the kids see the past through the eyes of the elders, and the elders can imagine the future through the eyes of the kids. I think that's good for mental health. It's good for the mental health of our species that tends to think about what's going to happen in the next quarter of somebody's spreadsheet and not the long term. And we published this as we've published several of our cases in uh, in this case, the Journal of the American Geriatric Society, in an article called Occupy Nature, Passing Activism Across the Generations. And that is precisely what we want to do, which is to have everybody have a sense of responsibility for their community, not only each other, but the other species and the other parts of the ecosystem. Why am I talking about this in a conference that's supposed to talk about the future of psychiatry and mental health? This is the answer to many things. This, is a, this, this reinvention of public education is an attempt, I'm sounding a bit immodest, to say that there are a number of pro problems that could be addressed through enhancing our communities and because schools should play an increasingly important part in our communities, enhancing schools. So these kids learn about local food. And that has a public health implication and that has a personal health implication for kids that live in food deserts. I'm starting a school-based clinic in that school, which is designed to bridge primary care and public health. So we've got, and we've got a mental health component and a, to that, which I'm sure you are not surprised. So this notion that in community you can reinvent and do things that will prevent mental health problems, that will prevent dementia, that will prevent a lot of things that ail us because we unite together with a sense of purpose that is not only serving of our own community today, but of our community in the future. In this particular photograph in the middle there, I manifest as a tree doctor. So without telling anybody, and dressed with more leaves on it than are shown there, I walked into this arboretum and started interacting with these kids and uh, having some fun. I was actually lucky in retrospect that, that somebody didn't throw me out because somebody might have said I look like a hunter. But anyway, uh, the, the point of a tree doctor, and I'm much into stories and much into metaphors, as many of you are, is that a tree doctor is a kind of shamanic figure. Because shaman uh, get the idea that stories are important and get the idea that individual health and community health are intimately related. So a tree doctor is a tree that doctors human beings. So you can say that you have been spoken to by a tree doctor today. Thank you.